introduction. Uh, so as you mentioned, I'll be talking about the existence of subspace designs. And all of this work is joined with Peter Kivosh and Matap Sami. All right, so perhaps I should begin by talking about what designs are for those who aren't super familiar. So let me first talk about classical designs, um, which are often called Steiner systems. So there are a couple of ways to notate them. I'm just going to use one particular one that I think is somewhat clear. So let's define an NSR lambda design, which to us will be, let's say, a multi collection of subsets of one through n. And my collection will be composed of subsets of size S within this ground set of size N, such that every size R set, which is inside of these elements, is covered exactly in the So to be precise, each of these size S subsets, let's say S is greater than R, has some size R subsets. And if I include all of those across this entire multi-collection and I sort of tally it all up, then each R set should appear exactly one at the times. And I guess of particular interest is the case where lambda equals one, um, which is often called just a Steiner system as well. Uh, and perhaps I'll just say that, uh, this is sort of an offhand note. Uh, you call it simple if uh, it is just a collection instead of a multi collection. So, I mean, in the case where lambda equals one, which we're most interested in, it'll automatically be simple by fiat. Um, but that's just sort of a thing we'll see. And there are other ways to notate this as well. So, for example, this could also be called an R dash NS lambda design which is sometimes used when talking about block systems and other things, um, but I'll just stick with this one. All right, so in terms of the history of these sorts of objects, I guess these have been studied for a very long time since you know the mid 1800s. So I guess perhaps one of the more notable early results, and I don't wanna go through the precise ancient history here, but there is a result of Kirkman from I think 1846, where it shows that Steiner systems. So in this case, I mean, uh, with these parameters, so I guess you could say Steiner triple systems with parameters three, two, and I guess lambda equals one exist precisely when n is either one or three mod and he does this through some explicit constructions. Um, so perhaps just as a simple example, we can look at n equals seven. And for, if there are any geometers in the audience you might be familiar with or drawing of the fan plane. So you can see each of these sort of colored lines or circles is a group of three, and you can check that every pair is in exactly one of these lines. And this is really actually a, these are actual bona fide lines over F2 in some sense. Um, but yeah, so this is sort of one of the foundational results, and it's actually one of the older results in combinatorics. And since then, there's been a lot of interest in general in understanding these systems, especially when these parameters three and two are changed with something more non trivial. So. Perhaps I should just mention that when R equals one, this is almost completely trivial because I can just sort of partition the set of elements in whatever way I want. So really you're interested in R at least two. Um, and there's been a lot of focus on this problem in general. So perhaps one comment uh, about this condition on N mod six is that in general,
certain divisibility conditions. Must hold. Uh, that is for it to be possible for this system to exist. Um, so for those who have seen it, uh, perhaps you already have an idea of what I'm going to write down. Let me first just write the precise condition and then we can discuss it. So we have the following divisibility of binomial coefficients for i between 0 up to r or r minus 1, really. So s minus i choose r minus i divides lambda times a similar binomial for n. And the way this is derived is you just look at sets containing, let's say, a fixed index set i. Size of I. The way I've written it equals no I. So, for example, when i equals zero here, you just look at all sets and you plug them in. You say, okay, I have to hit this many r sets, and each s set that I add in contributes s choose r, and so it has to evenly divide. But similarly, you can do something for degrees and co-degrees and so on, and you get these natural conditions. As we will see later, in general, for design problems, these sort of so very obvious conditions are not actually always all the conditions you need, but in general, it'll come from a study of a more general lattice perspective that we'll talk about here. All right. So I guess a natural question, once you understand these divisibility conditions, is if I have these, can I have a design? Um, and OK, there's no precise, uh, I think, history on exactly who asked this first. But this was a long-standing question, um, almost since the very early days of second designs. Uh, sometimes called the existence conjecture. So I guess maybe one way to state it is that if, um, let's say, fix S and R, and maybe lambda, maybe lambda is equal to one, uh, whatever, or n large. There exist appropriate designs if n satisfies. We call the star the obvious divisibility conditions. So it's actually not super hard to show that, like, if n is. You know, really close to these underlying parameters. There's just not enough space to fit in all of these sets. So there's some sort of simple bounds that have been known um, regarding that. But the idea would be, OK, if I fix all these parameters and let n go to infinity, certainly there should be enough space. Or maybe not certainly, but it feels like there's enough space that maybe you can get something to work. Um, but on the other hand, uh, a lot of examples were not known for this because there's not really as much symmetry in general as in this very structured algebraic set. So let me talk a bit about the history of the classical design problem. And then we can sort of segue into uh, some of the broad techniques that are used in this area um, and that have been introduced since the work of Kivosh. And then perhaps after that or after the break, I'll talk about um, how we sort of introduce new ideas to deal with uh, the setting that we have. Um, but OK, let me talk first about the history of the design problem. Uh, so perhaps some of the, what one might call classical design theory work was done by Wilson and others, such as Ray Sheldon. So he has. Yes, a string of maybe two or three papers where he resolves r equals two of existence. And I believe there are also works on sort of graph decompositions more generally that I don't want to go into. So in the case where r equals two, after various works, he actually resolves it. And this is actually using quite sort of explicit um, uh, sort of techniques. And as we'll see, some of the stuff we do is a bit more probabilistic in nature. So perhaps kind of parallel to this, and this is actually a very important point, but I'm not going to elaborate exactly on the precise nature of this rule quite yet. There are works of Robert Ricca and Wilson 
on so-called integral designs. So what I mean by an integral design is basically instead of requiring you to have a multi-collection where everything's in you know no times or zero times or maybe a one time or two times or whatever, you're also allowed to have uh, some of these sets be in a negative number of times. And you're allowed to have inflation. And this corresponds actually to a question about a certain integral lattice, which is very much related to what I was talking about earlier. Uh, and this lattice theory actually is not just useful for some sort of abstract problem, but or just like characterizing this sort of thing, but is actually also useful for actual constructions of designs themselves. And I'll talk a bit about that later. And I'll elaborate a bit more on what this says for sets. But I'll, I'll just say, like, keep this one in mind as it'll be relevant. Uh, beyond that, for sort of more general design parameters, one of the notable results is the, is the result of Peerlink, who showed that simple designs exist for, I think, any S and N, basically. But this lambda. If their construction is required to be early and perhaps satisfy some divisibility type things. So I think I think the lambda here is like polynomial in that or something. So actually before this point, for general sorts of like if S was 10 and R was 9, not only did you not have any of these sorts of very nice designs at all, um, but before Keeling's result in general, you didn't even know that simple designs would exist for those parameters, even if I'm allowed to make lambda some larger number. Um, uh, okay, non-trivial. <clears throat> Growing just yeah, yeah, it's growing and growing. I guess. So, okay, so there's obviously you can just take an empty set and let lambda equal zero, and you can complement this and you can get another trivial design. But sort of for simple designs, there are lambdas between those two numbers. And uh, in general, I think before this result, for like if I just give you some terrible S and R, that is hard to understand, like any result where it's simple wasn't necessarily good. Um, but, but I think. I think the lambda they give is actually some polynomial on that. And I think I haven't looked too closely at the, the details. Um, and sort of this type of thing was actually sort of, I guess, proved again in perhaps a more general framework as well. There's this nice work of Cooperberg, Lovett, and Ron Pelley. The precise dates are a little funny because there are a couple of versions. Um, I'll just say 2012 to 2017. Um, and they actually sort of show the existence and counting of such designs. But again, lambda is growing. Lambda, again, is some polynomial on it, at least. Um, and, and the way they do this is actually they use certain local central limit theorems and uh, counting for certain types of lattice walks. Uh, and they actually do this more generally for a, a large variety of sort of combinatorial or robust combinatorial structures. So I guess the idea is once lambda is sort of big enough, there are enough sort of ways to try to approach um, the statistics that you want that maybe you can hope that you can get some control in sort of a, even like a fine, fine tuned probabilistic control of, of what these things look like in general. And they sort of very impressively managed to do this. All right. So I'm definitely missing some works along the way. There are a lot of other tangents that we can go on, um, but let me just sort of end the discussion of classical designs by talking about the groundbreaking work of Peter Kibosh, who proved existence. And then there was a separate proof that was given by Block, Low, Austis. I'll just give it the date 2016, which is a sort of different. So Kivash uses a method that I guess could be called randomized algebraic constructions. And Glockhoon, Low, and Austis use iterative constructions. They sort of 
use and also develop some more. Very broad section. I'm not going to really talk about this block and low analysis work, although it's a very nice work and it has many implications as well. Today, I'm going to mostly focus on uh, the work of Peter Kiwash and the randomized algebraic constructions. Um, and perhaps since we're talking about subspaces and subspace designs, maybe you can start to see why an algebraic approach might be interesting, although I'll also explain why it's not just obvious either. Um, yeah. And I should also add, um, for both of these approaches, uh, it's misleading to boil it down to a single sort of tagline. Both these approaches have a lot of very interesting and novel ideas beyond just these two sort of broad line headers. Um, and we'll, we'll get into a bit more detail about Kiwash's approach. All right, so this is all I'm going to say about sort of the history, et cetera, of classical designs. So um, if there are any questions about that, now would be a good time. If not, then I will move on to defining the objects that we're going to actually study, the subspace designs or Q analogs of designs or just Q designs. There are many terms for this. Um, I think the term subspace design is sort of uh, decided on in a recent survey and definitely rolls off the tongue. So let me define object right now. So now, since we're taking a Q analog, let's just put a Q here. But let me perhaps describe what this actually means. So in fact, you wouldn't be led astray if you just thought, OK, wherever there's a set, let's replace it with a Q space like a Q subspace, an FQ subspace. And that's, that's basically what we do. So I'm basically just going to copy the definition, but I'm going to replace things in appropriate places. So we take a multi-collection of subspaces now, instead of stacks. And those subspaces, instead of lying in like N choose S, they're going to lie in the Grossmannian over FQ within an N-dimensional space. And the subspaces are going to be of dimension s. So okay, maybe like, I'll write it a couple ways. So all this means is I look at this vector space fq to the n, and I look at all s dimensional subspaces over fq. And uh, for those of you who aren't algebraists, you can assume q is a prime. It'll make your life much easier. But you can also make it prime power of q to the one. All right. And of course, we have to satisfy some condition. And it's just the same condition as you would expect. Each R space is in exactly lambda. I guess contained in some sense. All right. And again, you can have a notion of simple design, etc. Okay. So these uh, are perhaps more rigid objects in certain ways than what we we're just talking about. And I'll say a bit more about why that is the case, like more, more formally, um, but you can perhaps imagine why, why that might be the case already. Uh, so let me just mention uh, that, I guess, a corresponding question for existence was asked perhaps separately by Ray Chaudhary and Cameron around the early 70s. And so I'll just say, at least I've asked the analog of existence. Can you have these designs with the proper parameters when n is large? And OK, well, you have to have some appropriate divisibility conditions as well. And perhaps if you believe in some things, you could say, let's just replace this binomial coefficient with the Gaussian binomial coefficient, which instead of counting the number of ways to extend a set to a bigger set like this, it's the number of ways to extend a subspace to a bigger subspace. And you would actually be right for the theorem that we were going to prove. Um, but in general, there's actually something more complicated around. Um, but for now, let me just uh, defer that until later. So there is much less known about sort of explicit examples or, or objects in, in this setting. So I'll just say there are a couple explicit constructions that are known, not in a very systematic way. 
And so I'll just refer to a very nice survey. Ron. See the matter. And Wasserman. On subspace size. And what I will note is that most of these, like these, are all indicates lambda is not equal. So if you really care about just sort of a pure design itself, every subspace includes exactly one sub covering everything sort of in the symmetric way. Um, arguably the most natural question to ask about. Uh, almost nothing is known. So I said earlier that. R equals one was trivial for classical designs. You just partition it set. So you could ask, well, is R equals one trivial here? Um, so you can maybe convince yourself that it's not completely trivial, but uh, thankfully for us, uh, the algebraic geometry has figured out how to do it. So uh, in this case, it's sometimes called a spread. And in fact, already in the work of Seger, uh, implicitly, uh, I don't think he was thinking about designs. Um, implicitly, this is some stuff about mod Q algebraic geometry and how it deals with field extensions. And there is a construction there that actually has this property. Um, OK. So R equals 1 can be solved algebraic, very rigidly algebraic, but kind, of, kind of like this panel plan from, from before, perhaps. All right. But beyond that, almost nothing was known. And in fact, it was sort of a dire situation. So there, were, there was a conjecture of mesh that no such designs exist where lambda equals one and r equals two. Um, and this. Uh, also, the I guess existence conjecture, or more, more just like, is it true or is it not, was actually reiterated in the survey by Gil Kali, um, where he was discussing Kivash's existence, and this was sort of a problem that was left open as an interesting direction as well. Um, and actually, only very recently, there is a very very nice work of Ron Etienne Osterard. Party and Wasserman. Which gives an explicit example of 13, 3, 2, lambda equals 1, 2 design. Actually, they give multiple explicit examples. And this is by this is by some computer methods. So uh, if you think about it, like a 13-dimensional space, even over F2 is actually quite big. Um, and now you're taking like subspaces in it. So this is actually a very, very non-trivial problem. And so they actually introduced a lot of interesting ideas to try to get this uh, to work out, including, I think they sort of find a natural automorphism group that they could sort of take as an onslaught says saying, okay, we're symmetric under this automorphism group and sort of start to work in this more simplified space and, and hope that something works out. And there are a lot of interesting ideas there and they create some of these designs. So that actually, I guess, disproves this, this conjecture. Um, but this is literally one non sort of other than the algebraic uh, situation, sort of one set of parameters that was known. Um, so, yeah. And perhaps finally, um, perhaps I won't write this down, but there's this very nice result of Cooper, Rick, Lovett, and Pellet. And uh, I guess Fazelli, Lovett, and Vardy um, sort of applied. The very general machinery that they have. Um, and there are some things that you actually have to prove in order to check that you can actually do this. Um, and so, so they did that and they showed that the machinery can in fact be used to prove sort of an analog of this result um, in this setting. So in particular, it does give you sort of a tier length type result of simple designs. But again, this lambda is going to be something that's growing. Um, this time, instead of being, I guess, polynomial in n, it'll be like polynomial in q to that. You can think of Q to that as sort of a natural um, base parameter here. All right.
All right, okay, actually, there is one more thing that I do actually want to mention, because again, as I said, it will sort of prove important, which is there's this result of Grover Jerkha and Wilson about integral designs. And this was actually done in 1989 by Ray Trotheri and So they actually sort of characterize the lattice, as I'll sort of talk about later. Um, but I will say that their result is actually more complicated than the classical case. And as it turns out, the sort of natural thing that you would write down is not sufficient. And again, I'll talk about this more in detail later. Um, and I'll, I guess, also mention that they do this result in two settings. They actually talk about projective, but they also talk about affine. So I'll, I'll just mention that when talking about subspace design, we talked about the Grossmannian. All these subspaces go through the origin. You could also ask for affine subspaces instead. And uh, we don't actually directly do this, but I think it's safe to say that the techniques are, are likely to apply. All right. Finally, let me state sort of the main theorem of our work. So, so upside, I guess. Let's fix Q, S, and R. Prime power, I guess S is bigger than R, is at least one. For N large satisfying star star. So these are going to be the visibility conditions. There is an And we can also do something analogous where you plug in a lambda here. All right, so, so what is star star? So now I'll actually sort of define these generalized coefficients properly uh, for those who aren't familiar with doubt and binomial coefficients. So let's just maybe give a quick and dirty definition, which is that n choose k sub q equals Q to the n minus one times q to the n minus one minus one turns out that off times q to the one minus one divided by, and then you sort of do the same thing q to the k minus one turns out that off times q to the one minus one. And similarly, q to the n minus k minus one that off q to the one minus one. And you can also view this as like n factorial q divided by k factorial q n minus k factorial q, where these are the q number factorials and, and so on and so forth. I, I'm not going to write that out. And sort of perhaps notably, this should equal, I think the way I wrote it, this should equal something like the size of the cross point, something like that. Okay. And then our visibility conditions, star star, are just going to be something like the same thing, but you put Q by those. And perhaps as a remark, we also get a counting result. Although, I guess technically we only do the counting result when lambda equals one. Um, but basically, uh, also with Kiwash's original work, um, not only does he sort of show that designs exist, but he shows that sort of asymptotics for the log number of designs. Um, so there's sort of a natural prediction that comes out of some entropic considerations. And there's this work of, uh, I think, Lineal and Luria, which gives sort of a natural upper bound based on that. Uh, and Kivach's original work shows the first two terms of that are, are sharp, 
when you take the log. And we can do something very analogous. Okay. So I think that's about it for sort of the background and history of this problem and perhaps some of the uh, sort of general techniques that had existed in the lecture before. So now I am going to, I guess, segue into talking a bit about what makes our situation a little difficult, and then also about, I guess, what people had even done to try to tackle the design problem in particular, and talking just sort of about the broad techniques that exist in this sort of area that can be used, um, and then try to get more specific and talk about our situation. Can I just interrupt yeah. you for a second? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, I mean, with designs, there is like they're connected to a lot of other things, and there are a lot of connections. And since this was asked about fifty years independently by two people, do you maybe know what was the motivation? What uh, yeah, so thinking about or I think general? the people who both. So I think Cameron was looking at a more algebraic perspective, but was still active in, in some of these areas. Ray Chaudhary is very much like a design theorist, and I think at the time when there were sort of some of these existence conjectures being solved. Um, I think they wanted to understand more rigid scenarios as well. I, I can't speak for what, what their motivation was entirely. Um, I will also say in this survey of Braun, Kiermaier, and Wasserman, they talk a bit about um, how this is related to some other areas like codes and, and other things. I think, for example, the three, two parameter case um, is related to like, I think, I want to say diameter perfect codes or something like that. Uh, there are some relations as well there. Um, but um, yeah, I can't say for sure. Yeah, that was a good question. All right. So let me perhaps first talk about, without even really talking about why the design problem was already hard, um, but let me just talk about why this might even be more restrictive on, on top of that. And then I'll talk more generally about designs. Probably. Okay, so I'm going to sort of just, this is not necessarily like super formal, but I, I'm thinking that we're starting with a very uh, rigid polymer scenario. So perhaps the one way to sort of think about this is when we were doing the Steiner system, let's say on seven points, um, we wrote down a final plane, we added the algebraic structure and everything became very nice, but we sort of had the freedom to do that. We had the freedom to impose the structure in sort of any which way we wanted. Um, and you could potentially say, well, maybe I could take one of these and start gluing them together and stuff like that. Um, and, and some of this, uh, old design theory stuff actually was sort of based on these types of operations. But if I have a subspace, you know, it's very rigid. I can't just sort of glue them together and expect them to, to, to work out. Um, and, and there are further issues along those lines. And in fact, there's something sort of a very special case. Um, let's actually think about um, what happens. So let's look at mod two. S equals three R equals two. So this is sort of the simplest case when R, R is bigger than one. I guess that is. Okay. So this is an N three two two one. So this is like the analog of Steiner triple system. Okay. So what is this actually? I claim. And if you look at that, then our three spaces are really seven non zero points, which all denote by A, B, C, A plus B, B plus C, C plus A, A plus B plus C, and zero. Whereas two spaces are I guess A, B, A plus B. So what I'm going to do is place a cleat on these seven non zero sort of vectors, I guess. So we have, I guess, two to the n minus one non zero vectors. And I'm placing a bunch of k sevens. 
So what happens? I claim that every edge, every sort of pair u comma b, and I guess f2 to the n minus zero is in exactly one case up. And the reason basically is if uh, two cliques share two points that are different, then they actually, those two points are, are not linearly dependent because we're over F2. The distinct points can't be linearly dependent. So if two of these K7s share an edge somewhere, it's like two points, let's say A and B with that velocity ground. Then A, B, A plus B is actually contained twice, which is not allowed. And similarly, because every two space exists, every edge UV gives me some space of the form A, B, A plus B, and it has to be contained somewhere. And so that gives me the K7 that contains it. So what this means is that this is actually two to the n minus one, seven, two design. But it's not just any two to the n minus one, seven, two design. How many possible K7s are we allowed to use? I choose A, B, C, rest is forced. Well, let's assume some identity of the non-zero vectors with one enough to two to the n minus one. So it's approximately two to the n choose three k sevens. And this is out of approximately two to the n choose seven. So this is this is much, much less in terms of the choices we have. And okay, the, these choices are structured in, in a nice way. Um, but really um, it's really hard to say anything if you just think about it in this general framework uh, about such a sparse set of cliques. Um, there's actually been a, a lot of recent work on considering thresholds for existence of designs where you sort of sample the subsets that you're allowed to use and only try to work within those. And in this sort of design, pe people are, are really not able to handle a density like this. So somehow we're gonna have to use that these are algebraically structured, but you can sort of see like in this case, literally this problem is just a harder version of this problem. So now let me just talk generally about some of the algebraic constructions that exist. So we sort of mentioned both of them, and let me just talk about them a bit more as sort of a segue into talking about the randomized algebraic construction. So, all right. And perhaps it's not obvious how you can fuse randomness in algebra quite just yet, um, but let's see this as a preview. Okay, so find your system. Here's one. Take triples x, y, z in log to the n minus zero cubed. Okay, really, I should take sets, but okay. Such that x plus y plus z equals zero. And this is sort of just the generalization of that panel plane construction from earlier. You can easily check every pair. X, y gives me x plus y is the final strip in the, in, in the top. So this is, I guess you could call it like a phantom plane construction. And this is sort of the classical algebraic construction. Um, and there are others over different characteristics for special uh, parameters. And if you're willing to go to like part type designs and some other things there, or willing to like allow for certain exceptions and algebraic de de degeneracies in your designs, you can sort of create more generalized phantom constructions that aren't really exactly designs, but have a lot of the properties um, and internal properties that this thing shares. And that'll actually be important uh, for the method later. On the other hand, I guess for the Q-Science system, as I mentioned, there's only this construction center for R equals one. Um, and it, there are some uses to it in the method that we use um, with the, the field extension that is present, but not really directly, but I'm just gonna sort of show it 
for completeness and to sort of give you an idea of what these very rigid algebraic constructions are forced to look like. Um, although I don't think every spread has to be of, of this form. But okay, so here it goes. You have an N S one Q design. And if you plug it into the sort of divisibility conditions you have and you do a bit, a bit of basic number theory, um, should exist. If and only if S divides as it turns out. So it's actually the same as the classical design. Uh, but okay, we, you can show that this is required, but how do we show that it exists? So here's, I guess, sort of a very clever construction, which is we look at the finite field with Q to the n elements. And this is just some vector space, and it has a multiplication. And since S divides N, the finite field with Q to the S elements actually is a subfield by Galois theory. So you can view F Q to the N as a vector space over the smaller field. Maybe I'll even put an F here just in case. Okay, let's look at every one dimensional space over this, this field. These are just some sort of sets of vectors. And if you think about it, a one dimensional space over this is the same as an S dimensional space over. So this sort of provides a candidate for the construction. And then you can sort of convince yourself that some very basic linear algebra and carrying around these three fields in the appropriate way. You can convince yourself that this actually works. But perhaps let me just give you an illustration of what this looks like um, in a very explicit example. So let me get a color. Up. It's distinguishable. So perhaps uh, writing if and only if is a bit misleading, right? Uh, every one dimensional space is an S dimensional space over F cube, but not the other way around. But that's fine. That's the direction you want, right? Yeah, this is not if and only, this is correspondence. You know, but I think it's not the uh, exact correspondence. Right, it, it, sure, every sure. guy on the left is what guy on the right. Yeah, and, and this is not meant to be a formal state, uh, to be clear. Yes, okay, but it's the direction you need, right? Yeah, you're right. only allowed to use s dimensional spaces yes, over yes. FQ. All of those on the left are s dimensional spaces over FQ. Yes, okay, so continuing, let's look at, I guess. Mod two, S equals two, R equals one. I guess lambda equals one technically. And let's look over four dimensions. So we care about F16. And I'll just say the way you generate it is you look at this root over mod two. It's not too, too hard to see. And I guess also it's important to note that x squared plus x generates f4, which is a subfield of f6. Okay. So that tells us what this thing is, which is f16, and this thing, which is f4 is. So now all we need to do is draw the elements and sort of see what happens. So let me just draw sort of the square here. All of the elements. So let's start with one. We use the element x squared plus x to generate the subspace. So let's multiply one by x squared plus x and let's get another element. And then the final element of my two dimensional space will just be by adding. Let's look at x and let's do the same thing. So if we multiply by x, I think we should get x cubed plus x squared. And then so we can add them and we get, I think, 
x plus x squared plus x squared. You do one plus x. And basically, the next element is going to be sort of the sum of these two guys, which is x plus x cubed. And then when you add these two, you get this guy. And zero is in all of these, by the way. You guys should do and finally, I think there should be two more. Let's wait for the next one. If we look at x squared and we multiply, then we end up getting this and the sum of these two, which is this. And finally, I guess, perhaps a green. You can sort of see how these 15 non zero elements have been partitioned by these sets in algebra. So, this is a very highly symmetric sort of object. So, it's not clear again how to generalize this uh, proper. All right. I'm going to raise some of the basic definitions now. And I'm going to talk, I think, briefly before a break about some of the broad techniques that were used to show existence of designs with sort of a, maybe an algebraic flavor, but in this sort of setting where you don't have these explicit constructions to fall back on. But what can you even do to serve it? So let me just talk a bit about constructing design. So we've already seen a couple of specific examples that are going to be useful later, but it seemed for a long time you can't really do anything with those past that very restricted version. So first, there was a lot of work done on understanding and constructing approximate designs. So there are a lot of works on this. Perhaps uh, most notable is the result of Rodel, uh, which introduced the Rodel nibble and sort of hypergraph coverings more generally, which I think was around 1985. Um, and this basically let you construct, for example, um, in the case of so I'll just I'll just describe what this would show in the case of n three two the classical design, um, and note that. This is equivalent to I have n points. Every set of size three gives me a triangle. And all these triangles together cover every pair, et cetera. So this is actually a triangle decomposition of the complete graph. And so what Rodel Nibble would give you is let's say a one minus little one fraction of edges covered by additional fractions. And this is using a very clever probabilistic process that makes it very nice to analyze. Where basically you sort of drop in the expected correct number of triangles, you delete overlaps, you've made some progress on the problem. Now you look at the remainder and you sort of iterate the process. And you need to know that at every step, the graph that's remaining is sort of quasi random in some ways to continue it on. Uh, but it's a very nice analysis. And perhaps, I guess, in more modern times, uh, there is an approach using the triangle removal process, which is often going to be analyzed via martingale techniques. So, again, you can sort of think of this as a randomized algorithm, but instead of Rodel's nibble, this is actually very straightforward to understand. All you do is you look at the graph, and then you remove a uniformly random triangle from the current graph that you have. 
and you continue the process. So this gives you a list of triangles. And the claim would be that this, with high probability, will go until you have a very small number of edges left over. Um, I don't want to write the exact history behind all of this, but um, for example, there is sort of a conjecture, a notable conjecture by Bolovash and Erdish about this. And uh, Spencer sort of proved the initial version, and then there were further results of Rodel and Tama, as well as Rebel. And then finally, Bowman, Fries, and Lubetsky basically showed the optimal, nearly optimal behavior for how many edges will be left over. So I'll just write Bowman. They show that there's an end of three house plus literal one remainder. Although we will never need anywhere near as good, but it's a very impressive result regardless. So there's a lot of work even on these sorts of algorithms that are used to construct approximate designs and approximate coverings, et cetera. Um, and a lot of these sort of these types of results are using the so-called differential equations method or Martingale method for analyzing these random processes. That I don't want to talk too much about, but it's a very rich area of study and it's also been used, for example, Bowman Kivash to study the triangle free process or graph free processes as well. Uh, think about Ramsey numbers, et cetera. All right. So we at least have this approximate design result to go on. And in fact, the machinery here is actually quite general. You can use it to solve sort of hypergraph covering problems in a large degree of generality. Um, and there's a lot of machinery that's been developed along those lines. So if you want just an approximate subspace design, you can basically just use this approach. And it's, I guess, by now standard. But I guess the devil is in the details, and the detail is how do I get literally every edge to appear exactly once? How do I get literally every subspace to appear exactly once? I don't want approximate. I want really a legitimate design. That was what made the existence of designs question so hard, for instance. So the sort of general technique of completion often goes under the name absorbers. But absorbers isn't really a field of study precisely. Um, it's a large conglomeration of different techniques that people sort of contribute and use. Um, there's no real formal definition. Um, what I'll say is that this was sort of the absorber approach to a lot of these problems or graph problems, et cetera, was pioneered by Erdish, Garifash, and Piber, and maybe more systematized by Rodel, Rachinsky, and Semerich. But OK, well, what do I mean by this? Well. Let's maybe step back a little bit and maybe take a more algorithmic perspective to constructing designs. So we had these algebraic things, which were very nice, but now we're sort of talking about this probabilistic approach. So you can really think about the rotal nibble or the triangle removal process as a probabilistic randomized algorithm. You remove a triangle, you remove a triangle, et cetera. This is some randomized process. It'll terminate at some place with a really good probability. I can analyze it. Great, I have this approximate design. The absorber is sort of, the idea of one way to put it is I want to design an algorithm, perhaps again, probabilistic algorithm that sort of fixes that remainder up in some way. And to do this, you often have to sort of plant something nice enough to begin with that I can use to fiddle around with. Because I mean, a priori, I don't know anything about this remainder. It's just small. It could be weirdly distributed. In fact, if I actually run this triangle removal process until I can't remove any triangles at all, there are literally no triangles left. So, in that sense, I, I, it will be over. So the idea or perhaps the picture to have in mind is maybe I'll make it yellow. Let's maybe see one. So, okay, so we have this big graph to begin with. Or in the design case, we have either a graph or a hypergraph. For us, we have some space like a FQ. And at the beginning of time, we plant a sponge. Maybe doesn't look like a grid, but okay. So we have this yellow sponge, and we sort of, I guess, eat away all the stuff. We remove some triangles, or remove whatever it is, and then at the end of time, maybe we have a bit of leftover. So we're so instead, once we've planted this very hopefully structured sponge, this absorber, uh, let's say we sort of run one of these processes on the remainder, and to do this properly, to get a small sort of outcome, you actually have to debias the process, but this is sort of a technical detail. Once you do this debiasing appropriately, you can sort of show 
you'll have like a remainder, which I'm going to put as blue. And maybe it'll be small, even with respect to the sponge. Now, if I have a sponge and if I have some water, <laughs> I guess the hope or the dream is that the sponge absorbs the water. Uh, and so formally, what that would be is I would want this yellow sponge that I planted at the beginning of time to have the property that for any sort of small remainder that could be left over by this nibble, um, for any such remainder, maybe with a couple of properties to make it nice and uniform, any such plus the sponge would be decomposable. That is a property I need, which you might call the absorber property. The absorption property. And sort of as I've discussed this, this is going to be the heart of the matter. And this is really super non-trivial to establish in, in any case, but especially in the design case. So the reason that designs especially were, were very difficult is that there was really no good candidate for the sponge and, and everything that you could use sort of would fail. So for example, I think the maybe some of the earlier observers like the Rodolfo Ruchinsky already, and, and, and there are even some modern ones that sort of are constructing this way. What you can do is you can kind of set aside a random portion of whatever you're trying to construct. And then at the very end, you can sort of just show this random thing is very robust and I can fiddle around with it so I can make something. Uh, but for designs, uh, if I just take a random set of triangles to be my sponge, and then at the end of time, I have this extra stuff and I try to fiddle around with it, there are no ways to fiddle around with this random set of triangles to turn them. So there's no structure. So I guess the idea behind the randomized algebraic construction method is to try to utilize these rigid algebraic constructions that hopefully have some structure, have them planted as the potential sponge, and use those robust properties to try to absorb the water or the leftover. So let me just give sort of a hu broad heuristic outline, and then maybe we can take a break. So I'll just put it here. Here's sort of maybe a high level, not really accurate summation of what you might try um, with this key wash approach. First, I'm gonna plant a fan of light structure slash sponge. This is gonna be a collection of size S sets. And it's gonna sort of be structured in that way. So in the actual Fano case or in the Steiner triple system case, I would literally try to take some subspace of one of these Fano things and just plant it somewhere in this chaos. Really, you have to modify it in certain ways, but okay. And so that is a collection of triangles, but hopefully those triangles are well-structured as a sponge, let's say. Once I've removed those triangles, I'm going to approximately decompose the rest. Finally, and again, this is the non-trivial step. We have the leftover, we have the sponge, and the left is about absorbers. And this is, again, the key step. And this is, I stated, it's not even clear why you could hope to get a handle on this at all. And perhaps just, I guess, two reasons for this. The first is that the leftover is anything, really. I mean, it's not literally anything, but maybe we know it's small in some quantitative sense. But beyond that, it could be distributed any which way. Like, it could be graphed and might not even have triangles. Like, how do we even get anything out of, out of it at all? And perhaps the second uh, thing that maybe we're forgetting here, which might pose an issue, might not, who knows, is like, where did the divisibility go? Yeah. And okay, if you think about things in a certain way, you can sort of convince yourself that it's not actually an issue, but this will sort of lead into one of the sort of key ideas and in this, uh, I guess, lattice approach um, that I'm going to talk about in the second half. Um, 
So perhaps just as a prelude, I'll say some of this is answered. Both of these questions are kind of partially answered by using uh, a lattice approach and then using certain randomized algorithms alongside a certain lattice to try to sort of massage an integral representation of the leftover instead of trying to go for the throat immediately. And then after doing a bunch of this massaging and using the nice properties of the sponge and its robust properties, you can massage yourself in a way such that all of a sudden you find that the water can be mapped into the holes appropriately and the sponge uh, fills up. Um, and then perhaps also in the second half, we'll talk a bit about what we need to do to replace this, as well as to replace this understanding of the lattice, which is significantly more complicated. All right, I think now is a good time to take a break. Right. So I guess I promised a bit more discussion about some of these steps. Um, and I guess to start answering these questions, of how could you even accomplish the hard step? Uh, let's talk a bit about the lattice perspective of design, which I think is very valuable. In general, and it has a line applicability when thinking about some of these problems. All right, so let's talk about this result of Robert Yurkov. Uh, so let me define some objects. So I'm going to define uh, a map, partial SR, and it's going to map from the following integer space. So what I do is I have a basis element for every set of size S in it. And I just take the span of these, the axis inside of us. And my image space is going to be sets of size R. I'm going to map S to the sum over all R in S, choose like capital S, choose R, E sub. So for example, in the case 3.2, for the classical design, this would send a triangle to the sum of its edges, sort of a boundary map. Make sense? And I guess the point is uh, design is really an element in partial SR inverse of the all one vector with only zero one coefficients. You just, because this really just counts on each R, how many guys can get. So in this case, if you have only zero one coefficients, then you have what, what we want. And in general, you could ask. Just in general, one of those designs would be with non-negative coefficients, and you can ask for simple, which are ones, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the point is, Z allows for this generality I alluded to earlier, where I'm allowed for positives and negatives to potentially cancel out. And a priori, this seems maybe a much easier problem, and indeed it is. Uh, and maybe it doesn't seem directly applicable, but we will see how there are those relations. So perhaps just the question that was asked by these two independently is what? is the image of delta s r. So does anyone perhaps have an idea of what the answer may be? Anything that's like set of visibility? Yep, exactly. So anything that satisfies the obvious visibility conditions should. Hopefully. So also just to make it clear, this image is a lattice inside of this. And it ends up actually even being full dimensional. Uh, but okay. In fact, that, that particular is not, not super hard to see. But okay. So what is image? Answer. We need S minus I, choose R minus I 
to divide the sum of, I guess, V sub R if V is a vector. If R contains capital I for all capital I of size I. The proof for this is, or the proof that these are necessary is basically the same as before. You look at the set of size capital I, you look at how much any of these contribute to it, they'll contribute like something like this or zero. And therefore the total contribution has to be divisible. The harder part, I guess, would be showing that this is actually, and this is the content of these works. There are a couple of ways to do it sort of inductively kind of, and there are a couple other, there are many ways to sort of see this in this case. Um, I don't want to go into the exact details, but um, this is actually the precise characterization of files. So in some sense, these are the obvious activities of All right, so what about the setting of subspace files? So here I mentioned the work of Ray Trothery and Finney. And they actually do app on end projector. And here, unfortunately, it's actually more complicated. So you can again sort of say, okay, I look at a subspace of dimension I, inclusions, et cetera. So there's actually extra visibility conditions. And in some sense, I'll, I'll call them kind of like transverse conditions or something like that. There's like a general way to write them that you can try to convince yourself means something, but it's just sort of just more general. Um, I don't really want to go into the exact details, and those exact details are not fully relevant um, because of the approach that we end up taking because of this. Um, but perhaps the point is that this lattice is actually more complicated. Um, and one of the reasons for this uh, that they give heuristically is just that um, if I have a sub, if I have two subspaces, one contains another, and I'm sort of like looking at that sort of general setup for whatever reason, the difference of the subspaces is not a subspace, whereas the difference of two sets in that way is, is a set and somehow that makes some difference when you, when you run some of these arguments. But there is a characterization and if we want, I guess only a and S R lambda Q design. This degenerates. So the extra conditions end up sort of not mattering in this very symmetric situation, and it ends up degenerating to just what we call the star star. So in terms of the sufficiency for this sort of all lambda's vector will be in the corresponding image of, I guess instead of delta SR, it will be delta SRQ with the cross monuments plugged down up here. It turns out that we just need these conditions because we're in the symmetric case. But if we weren't and there's some imbalances, there would actually be some funny transverse conditions that show up. So the lattice is more complicated, but the condition we need for the design question is helpful. And I guess as our theorem shows, uh, yeah, okay. okay, so these are sort of the general design theoretic results that were known. How can we try to utilize these to shed something interesting on this setting of I have my sponge, I have my water, how do I make it all fit in? So, and this is sort of why I said, you know, the Kivash method, for example, is it's not just, oh, I have an algorithm structure. There's a lot of other working pieces to it. And I guess one of the key technical results that's proved in this work um, is actually, I guess, what one might call a robust integral composition. So you say, OK, if I, if I have a vector that satisfies the disability, it's in this lattice. This result will just give me some representative. The way they do it, they do some induction, they do all the stuff. The coefficients, since they're allowed to cancel each other out at the end of the day, can be quite massive. The hope would be, well, if I plug in something, 
for which I want to take its inverse, which is like, you know, a one zero vector, or, you know, maybe it's something like this leftover that I care about. It's like my leftover plus sponge, something like that. I would hope, I mean, I would hope that it has zero one coefficients, but failing that, let's try to get to be low height in a sort of arithmetic form. So not big numbers in, in my coefficients. Let's try to get a representative that's low height. So in some sense, I want a robust decomposition um, because, okay, they just give existence. I really want something that satisfies nice properties and has nice reference to it. So Kiva Shashi establishes a result like this where he shows, okay, as long as the thing that I'm taking the inverse of is bounded in an appropriate technical sense, I can get an output which is also sort of bounded in an appropriate technical sense. But it will have positives, it will have negatives. It will have the whole sort of, and there will be cancellation and there really will even be multiplicities, at least out of the game. So now, with this lattice structure in mind, we can perhaps try to fill in some of the pieces in that step three. Okay, so perhaps let me label some of these pieces now. So in this diagram, we had the leftover, the water, which we call L. And we have the absorber, which we're going to call A. So, okay, so we're going to break, I guess, this step three into a bunch of smaller steps. Step A, still. L inside A. Basically, what this means is, for example, if you think about a Steiner triple system in this diagram, we have some leftover edges on the outside and we have some structured triangles on the inside. I take each edge and I sort of find an extension to a triangle that sort of the other two edges are maybe inside of A in some way. And this will, of course, break some of the structure of A and some of the nice triangles in there. That's fine. We're just going to sort of spill it inside and we're going to cover it by the triangles in this way. So that now we're sort of only left with stuff inside of the sponge itself to work in. And now we're, everything sort of has access to its robustness. Okay. So B, I guess, would be use robust. Composition. On what? So once we spill the L inside A, our whole design will be the outer stuff, the red stuff, the things that we used to spill inside A, and also A. And so currently, we actually have sort of our image under partial SR, if you think about the set of triangles that we put in, has one, two coefficients. Everything is covered, but some of these edges, what we call a spill, is covered twice. Those extra edges that we put in. So these extra edges, we're going to call that S, spillover. Now, the idea is going to be, at a high level, we're going to find a way to sort of tweak things so that I can remove this extra copy of S somehow. Currently, I'm, it's in too many times, and I want to somehow rotate things around and then just remove some triangles that magically remove S. But as currently stated, we, we can't do that. And that's where we need to use the sponges property. So let's use robust integral decomposition on S. Wait, can you explain again why why the two are a bit confused? Just so that I don't get lost. Mm -hmm. Why do you get the two? Are, are you are you are you just considering everything inside A? So what what do you mean by, by spill L inside A? 
Yeah, so for every everything in the blue part, you're finding a corresponding way to complete it. Yeah, so so yeah, so for everything in the blue part, basically, I'm gonna let's say find a triangle that contains this edge uh -huh. that where the other two edges are inside of A. Uh -huh. But but the but the lattice that you're constructing only has things in A. Is that it or not? So so the lattice is is this very general. Oh, it's the whole thing. Yeah, and partial SR operates in, in general G, right? Okay, so but, then why but, so once it? once I've spilled inside of A, right? You agree I have some things that appear twice. No, because I don't understand what spill inside A means. Okay. So the red part is just some set, I have some set of triangles. Uh -huh. Okay. And you can think of that as just a vector in this left right, side of the space. Right. Okay. So you do keep the red part. Yeah, yeah. So, so so let's keep that always. Okay. Okay. Now I have this explain blue part. why there are no zeros. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so okay. So the red part covers everything on the outside. Uh-huh. Now I'm left with L and A. Uh-huh. Okay. Every part in A is going to be covered by this spilling operation where for each edge I'm covering it with a triangle that involves two of these other things. Okay. So then those things are going to be triangles that again are on the left side and they have an image, and that image fully covers L and covers some edges inside of A. Ah, oh, I, I see. And then finally we have the original triangles from Oh, you have the original yeah, yeah, yeah. that's where yes. that's true. We are using the original triangle. Uh, that is a good question. Um, that is sort of kind of a technical point, but also it makes it clear why you can use the A structure completely. Yes, <laughs> that is a very good question. All right. So we have this S is, by the way, on the right side of this image. It's a set of edges. And the point is, since we sort of put in triangles only, so we put in stuff that's on the image of this map and our original thing was in the image of the map. You can convince yourself S is in the image of the map. So you should have a pre-image. And in fact, we have this robust interval decomposition. And so the idea is hopefully this spill is really small in some sense. And so we can use this, uh, this idea to get something that's some pre-image that is small, albeit it has positive and negative signs and all of that. So C is, we have a low height inverse, and, and that's just coming from B. But I guess in C, we're going to do an additional step, and we're going to try to make it plus minus one coefficients. So the idea is I have this inverse over here, and this map is surjective but not injective. So there are going to be some sort of local kernel vectors of this map, and you can construct them in, in various ways and convince yourself they exist. And we basically want to use those and think of those as kind of flips and add in certain local kernel vectors to this representation in a way that spreads it out and spreads out some of these heights so that, in fact, every space or, or every triangle, I guess, in, in the case, is only appearing plus one times or minus one times. If something appears five times, I want to replace one of those fives with sort of this disjoint thing that's sort of in some way. And we want to do it in a controlled way, of course, um, with a lot of extra hypotheses. But um, one can imagine this is doable. And this is, I guess, sometimes called a fake exchange algorithm. And this, to get all the guarantees you want, it really is going to be a randomized algorithm with some <laughs> properties and all of that. So this is sort of the next step of our randomized algorithm, I guess you could say. D is where we, I guess, perform the coup in a sense. So at this point, we have some plus one coefficients for S and some minus one coefficients for S. And remember, S is the extra stuff. We want to remove S. So in order to remove S, it's kind of equivalent to removing the spaces that have a plus one. And that'll remove S and a bit more. And then you add that to minus the space. And that'll fill in the hole that was left by removing a bit more than S. So there's a bit of a sort of sign funniness that you can think about, but this is the idea. And the key issue is how do we do this? And this is where the structureness of the sponge, the absorber, whatever, really comes into play and, and has to be robust. Because 
we had these algebraic triangles to begin with that form A. And those might not a priori be these. These might not be of that form, so we can't just remove them. The point is there are enough rotations in a robust way, enough sort of cascades is maybe what Peter calls them, such that I can rotate some of the some small sets of triangles A and create different triangles instead. And I can do it in a way such that I can do all these separate rotations, sort of plug up these holes. And by iterating this a couple of times, be able to create any sort of reasonable collection of plus one spaces that I need, as long as it's small and disjoint in some way. And if you believe that you can do this, uh, this is going to be another randomized algorithm, by the way. If you believe you can do this, then you can do this step and sort of all the pieces come together. Uh, one way uh, I've heard Matab describe this is you sort of have a carpet and sort of stuck against a corner and it's pushing up and you try to push it down in all these places and somehow you find this way to magically put it flat. So you can sort of see how even though the lattice perspective is really this kind of algebraic thing about a lattice, about these positive negative numbers, maybe there's some number theory involved, et cetera. You can see how this both sort of handles its divisibility in a nice way, and also sort of explains how you can get a handle on something where you don't even know it has a triangle to begin with by giving you these signs. And then sort of maybe the coup is that we have some spaces in A to begin with that we can remove and shift around in signs. All right. So now let's talk a bit about the specific case of subspace designs. This sort of ends maybe the broad design theory perspective uh, with what, whatever time I have left. Okay, let's talk about a couple issues that we have. First is the lattice structure. And in fact, even in some of the follow ups to existence of designs, doing more complicated things like resolvable times, orthogonal systems, all of that, um, even in those, the lattice can get a bit more complicated as well. But for us, it's, it's quite annoying to, to handle, in, in fact. Um, so, in proving this robust interval decomposition, uh, Kivash makes use of these very nice kind of generating sets, I guess, for this lattice that are sort of associated to certain octahedra. Um, and this also plays a role in a lot of other absorption steps as well, these nice octahedra that show up. Um, and that makes it, I would say, in some ways much simpler to establish something like a robust interval decomposition. Uh, for us, because of this Ray Child 3 Singh result, it sort of kind of implies that you're going to need some harder results, especially since like the spillover S, right? It's not symmetric in the way that the Q design is symmetric. And so it does need to satisfy this extra condition. So you can imagine there's, there's some extra work involved here and it's not completely obvious how to proceed. And maybe the sort of second, in some sense, question that we raise is, we have this algebraic structure. And it exists a priori. So when constructing the sponge, or what Kibosh calls the template, I mean, we just have a set of, we have a KN or whatever, and we're just trying to cover it. He basically just embeds one through N into some bigger vector spaces in some ways, in many ways, actually, plants a bunch of these copies, you know, creates this algebraic structure just for free on top. There's complete freedom there. Uh, we do not have complete freedom in that sense, right? We already have to respect something. We have to respect the FQ structure no matter what we do. We don't have arbitrary sets. We, we have these structures. Right? And so it's not completely clear how you might create some of these rigid objects, even more rigid objects to work with to then sort of bootstrap as, as our sponge, for example. So at, at a high level, you can think of these as being some sort of in terms of the objects that need to be created, some of the key difficulties. And then the hope would be if you have objects that have enough properties, you might be able to run 
a procedure with some similarities to this one. Any questions before I talk a bit about our specific group techniques? Great. Let me first talk sort of at a high level about this first issue. I don't want to talk too much about it. There are, there are a lot of technical things involved in even proving the original sort of robust integral decomposition results I have had. But let me just talk a bit about what we do. So as I said, Kibosh has these very nice octahedral bases to work with. What we're going to do is we're going to take kind of an algorithmic perspective and say, OK, let's just generate. Oh, and sort of the key point of this octahedral generating set is that it's like as sparse as you could hope for. So it's a very nice structure. So what we're going to do is we're going to generate a sparse enough, almost generate set. in our lattice by basically a greedy algorithm. Of some form and try to control what the output looks like a little bit. Once we have that control, there are going to be some sort of gaps, things that we can't generate in the lattice, et cetera. The next sort of hope is that what we can do is use random automorphic copies to boost the almost property that we have into something more complete. Now, in I think the cases of small parameters like r equals two, this is actually not so hard to understand this boosting procedure, but for general parameters, you have to deal with a lot of sort of hypergraphs or Q analogs of hypergraphs. And there are some things that are, are, are not so obvious in, in this procedure at all. Uh, but at a high level, you could hope that something like this could replace this very nice structure that you knew to exist beforehand. Um, and really, you have to do this in a relativized sense in a sparse random hypergraph that I, I don't want to talk about. Um, but that's actually an element of, of all of these groups. Okay. Um, so I, some high level, we try to replace something by something we don't necessarily control fully, but again, try to use some sort of common control boosting techniques to get something more complete out of what we want and try to try to then use these sorts of generating sets and, and various techniques to then create a robust integral decomposition. Um, perhaps the one thing I'll say about this is what do I mean by automorphic here? So I guess the idea is if I like uh, the lattice in the classical case, has an SN action on it. And so you can literally just take a random permutation and that would be an automorphic copy, like in the colloquial sense that I'm talking about here. Um, for us, you don't have SN action. So we only have GL action. I can multiply by invertible matrix mod Q, that's like whatever. Um, so actually, as it turns out, um, there are a couple more technical difficulties because uh, GL, there's no like nice out of the box, like very strong concentration of measure that I can just apply and, and kill some. So we actually end up having to use a lot of method of moments um, within these Q analogs of hypergraph systems to, to get things to work out. That's more of a technical point, but I think it's at least a fun. All right. So let me talk about perhaps something that will be easier to say something concrete about, which is to show you how we get a handle on some of these phantom like structures in our situation. So it's not going to be phantom-like anymore, but these algebraic constructions that then we can randomize um, by sort of making them robust in certain ways. So I guess I'll just call this template. All right. So I maybe hinted this in some of the preludes, but the key idea is to use field extensions to sort of introduce a bit of extra leeway in some of these constructions. So currently, everything I've talked about, OK, there was the one special construction that I said, maybe we'll say this for later. Um, but it was it's all over FQ, right? The subspaces are over FQ, everything's over FQ. The idea is 
we're going to take the vector space and we're going to insert, let's say we have some L over FQ, field extension, finite degree. We're going to basically enforce some arbitrary, I mean, not arbitrary, like a random L vector space structure on our vector space FQ. And then to, for some technical reasons, we actually have to put many different incompatible L structures on this, uh, which actually is quite annoying to track. Um, but OK, technically here, uh, the degree of L over FQ has to divide N for this to be possible. So really, we do it on certain subspaces as necessary. But OK, let me just focus on the simplest example, no extra multiplicities, and let, let's make everything as nice as possible while still making it sort of amenable to discussion. So let's consider the case of a 2n32 design. So sort of a standard trivial system, two n dimensional just to fix everything up. And then let's do it actually mod three, not mod two, because it'll because I can use i mod three, so everything will be nice. Okay. So our vector space is f3 to the 2n. And my field extension, sort of L, is going to be F9, so degree 2, which derives from that divisibility. And it's going to be, I guess, isomorphic to F3 adjoined negative 1, which I'm just going to write as F3 adjoined. OK. And OK, perhaps I'll also say, just to be very explicit, X1 up to X2n. Let's say, just for simplicity, we're just introducing a single L structure, so it doesn't really matter how we do it. I'm just going to make it be every pair of convective coordinates, sort of yes, the way you might associate real space with complex space. Okay. So we're going to fix that sort of L structure. Great. Okay. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the following special matrix. There are many that work. They just need to be sort of algebraically generic in their appropriate sense. Three by two matrix. And it turns out you can kind of express some of the fano like constructions in a kind of similar framework, but it's, very, it's also very different. Um, but OK, I have this matrix. And, and what do I do with it? Well, if I apply it then to alpha, Beta, where alpha and beta are in, let's call this V, are in V. You can think of this as multiple, basically, this just gives you alpha, beta, alpha plus i, beta. This gives me three elements where I had two before. Okay, that seems kind of benign. What's the big deal? Well, if you see all over this, here's the big deal, which is, Let's let space alpha beta will span over mod three of these three elements. So now you can hopefully see why n needs to be complex and not sort of defined by F3. Because if this i was replaced by like two, this would be actually two dimensional. Since I is sort of not defined over F3. We have this algebraic relation and this linearity that still exists to hopefully work with and have some nice properties out of. But this is generically going to be three dimensional over F3. So perhaps specifically, I guess we can write um, if uh, alpha and beta are linearly independent over F3. Nine, then in over F three plus alpha beta. In, in fact, there are a couple more pairs, but you can sort of just explicitly check that have this property. But certainly, this is the case because if I had like x times this plus y times this plus z times this equals zero, then I could collect things and I would get sort of uh, a relationship for alpha and beta over F9, which you can show is not true, basically. Something like this. All right. 
So with this in mind, we have all these special three spaces, let's say only for these specific alpha and betas. And this is going to give me something that I claim is very algebraically structured and well structured in a certain way. I, I'm not going to be able to state sort of every property that you need, but let me just sort of explain why this is an almost design. And that's like one of the key nice things about some of these algebraic constructions. So let's look at a pair of perhaps arbitrary vectors, x and y. Okay. Let's actually step back even further. Let's look at a two space w. Okay. And I'll say it's spanned. So this is an arbitrary space. And let's just choose some arbitrary fixed representative as a basis. Excellent. Okay. Now let's look at how often W can appear in one of these. The ways that it can appear are basically I take my X and Y and I know they're in the span of this. And so basically there are a certain number of ways to put F3 coefficients on these elements that make them linearly independent um, and get various combinations. So for example, you know, one example could be equal to alpha beta. Another example is equal to beta alpha or could equal alpha and alpha plus two beta, et cetera. Perhaps a more non-trivial example is alpha plus two beta, beta plus two times alpha plus i beta, and so on and so forth. There are all these combinations, and you just check this x, y equal this. And the point is, each of these combinations, you solve as an F9, system of equations. And as long as this matrix was chosen appropriately so that sort of all of these non-trivial F3 combinations give rise to sort of matrices for alpha beta that like are invertible over F9. And you can do this in this case. And in general, you can imagine finding such a generic matrix. You would have a unique solution for alpha beta based on XY. And furthermore, if x and y are linearly independent over f9, then the alpha betas you get will actually sort of satisfy this as well. And most xy's, so any pair of xy that I choose, it might not necessarily be linearly independent over f9. There are certain special subspaces w that with respect to this particular subspace, you just sort of got messed up. For example, like I think if the first two coordinates, the span of the first two coordinates will have this property under this map, stuff like that. But generically, almost all pairs will actually have this linear independence well. And therefore, they'll sort of have this property that there's a unique solution for all these possibilities. And okay, I might have the numbers slightly wrong, but what this should produce is an almost 2n. Three, two, lambda, so three design, where it's perhaps lambda should equal three, choose two, mod three times, and then there's some choices for like coefficients. This is just some sort of coefficient counting computation. So you can sort of see how we get this very regular structure up. Now, okay, in this case, lambda is not one. So we have some multiplicity, if that's not so good. Um, and in general, for these generalized phantom structures, actually, you're gonna get something like this. And the way you end up fixing this is you basically subsample it in a very uh, specifically biased way so that you don't have this multiplicity anymore. Um, and you can also do a couple of diversifications and maybe include multiple copies so as to not have it concentrate in one portion of the graph, stuff like that. Um, but Hopefully you can see how this is going to be a very regular structure where there's a lot of algebraic structures to work with. And in fact, sort of the absorbing swaps and structures that we're going to use in some of these later steps actually are going to come from further algebraic constructions that are nice with respect to this L over FQ structure that we've inserted um, to sort of give ourselves the leeway. So perhaps uh, with that, uh, I don't have much more to say. Are there any questions?
So let me ask one question. So, okay, so for you mentioned, so that, so your result works for lambda equals one? It, it works for general lambda. It works for general, yeah. I think for the counting, uh, we didn't write out how to get the correct count for general lambda, but it would work if you did it with the appropriate general lambda. And do you have, so this was been asked at some point, but I was also wondering, so for this like hypergraph matching problem that would capture all of them, do you have something that, uh, that is at least plausible? Let's, let as, a, that. as a true statement, I personally don't, I think I remember, I think, I'm not asking something that you necessarily believe in. I'm just asking something that you cannot disprove and put theoretically. Well, I mean, I haven't thought enough about like the like hundred percent design question in that generality, so I wouldn't want to wager anything. I think what I will say is there's this work of Stefan Glock, Felix Juice, and some others. I don't remember um, off the top of my head the full name uh, list, but. Um, this is quite recent. It's like conflict-free hypergraph matchings. And there's also an independent work that actually does this more from a rotal nibble perspective um, by Delcourt and Possel. Um, also a very similar sort of set of results um, where- um, They're getting approximate, right? So both of them are sort of handling very similar types of problems. Um, and yeah, so they're getting approximate designs. And there's actually prior work where they don't look at conflict-free and they just look at you know without that but in fact even with a large degree of generality so make these things work through um and that framework is such that you know you can get an approximate design you can even say a lot of things about local statistics about them if you use the correct test functions etc and the conditions are very minimal like maybe i have an almost regular hypergraph in a sense that you can make precise or maybe even it has some actual matching like that sort of thing plus you have some basic like code degree style conditions and you say, okay, in this very large degree of generality, I can do a one minus one <laughs> matching. I can do all these things very nicely. I can get all this control. I'm not sure if just like that sort of degree, less code degree condition, like it, I, I would doubt that that would be enough in general. Like I, I imagine you could chart some funny examples that would violate that. But I guess the notion that somehow if it's symmetric enough and nice enough, maybe, maybe there's some master property that's lurking that we just don't understand yet. Something like that, one would hope as sort of a master theorem that you could do something like that. But I think certainly I wouldn't be able to tell you here's something that you should approve. But I think it would be of great interest if you or anyone really could, could go and prove any sort of statement in that level of generality. I mean, most of these things, the absorber, the randomized algorithm that we use, some parts are black box, kind of like this probabilistic approximate decomposition. Maybe you have to regularize the process slightly, whatever. But I mean, half of this, like the step three that I talked about is very, is very specific. So in this case, the last perspective is very useful for a lot of these absorption type questions, but maybe in a different problem. And indeed, when you do like iterative absorption, you don't really rely on it as, as, as closely. In fact, with the iterative absorption approach um, to the classical design question, they don't have to think about negatives. Like they never have to remove things that they've put in, in a sense. Um, so, I mean, I think it's something that I would like to know a lot more about. And I think all of us sort of taking this like combinatorial, external combinatorial design theory perspective certainly um, would want a resolution to, but it seems as of now perhaps a little far off. Thank you. Any other questions? No, let's take a thanks, Ashwin, for an amazing talk.